Chapter 7. The Unlimited Self The smell of bacon cooking, the click of our pop-up toaster, snow piled against the windowsill. A very ordinary morning. So why did I feel so depressed and miserable? Then I remembered, and I wished I hadn't. For a few moments I struggled desperately to blot from my memory the conversations with Raina. Failing this, I replayed it a couple of times, trying to find some flaw in my argument of futility, in my feeling of impossible inadequacy. I kept remembering the Macro Society's educational system and comparing it to my own early years. I remembered the incredible vitality, joy, beauty, intelligence, superhuman awareness, love, understanding, kindness, and patience that had been demonstrated by my Alpha. And I was seven years older than their oldest. Leah made a mistake, I thought. She should have created for me the body of a newborn baby. Then I could have started out in the first triad and 18 years later be on an equal footing with the others in the seventh triad. How could she have made such a mistake and still have demonstrated ninth-level awareness? And what was it Raina had said just before I lost consciousness? Something about asking for help? That whenever I really wanted help and not just pity... I would always receive it. Obviously, Raina, at the highest level of awareness in the macro society, was trying to tell me that it wasn't impossible. Could she and Leah be so wrong? Was I only asking for pity? If there's no hope, pity is all you can ask for. But how could I have hope? They were so perfect, I was so imperfect, and never the twain shall meet. I began laughing softly to myself at the ridiculous nature of my predicament. I was a perfect example of micro-man who sees himself as limited, inadequate, and doomed to ultimate failure. I searched my mind for hope, a way out. One of the greatest personal evolution tutors of all time said, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. He couldn't have put it much stronger. And of course he also said, If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. That's all right for macro-giants, I thought. But how the devil do micro-midgets like myself ever get up enough faith to even ask, much less move mountains? But if I want help, really want help, how could I have selected a better environment than the macro-society? Obviously, they knew and understood far more than I did. Maybe they even knew how to help me become a giant, too, so I could live with them on an equal basis, maybe. My thoughts were interrupted by Carl, insisting that I get up and join him for breakfast. I looked at the clock and saw that it was almost 8.30. Hey, Carl, I called. How come you're not in class this morning? His fuzzy black hair preceded his face around the doorway. He always wore it natural. You've really lost track of it all with all your shuffling back and forth 174 years every night. It's Sunday here in 1976. And if you try real hard, you'll remember that this micro-roommate inhabiting this micro-society doesn't work on Sunday. He just goofs off all day. Okay, okay, I said. You'll find me very humble this morning. I've been dreaming about just how really micro I am. I'll be right with you. A few minutes later, I was sitting across from Carl at the breakfast table telling him of my latest experience in 2150. Somehow as I talked to Carl, my depression lifted and I became hopeful again. It was a long breakfast because I seemed to have an awful lot to say, and Carl seemed to have even more than his usual number of questions. He was particularly interested in the other members of my Alpha and in my description of Rena. He kept asking me for more detailed descriptions, and I began to realize that after I had used up all of my personality superlatives, I didn't have much more to say about them. Finally, Carl said, You know, John, it seems to me that you're describing gods and goddesses and not the ancient Greek or Roman variety either, because they all had their share of weaknesses or imperfections. Not so with these you describe. Tell me, are these real people that are perfect, or are you just demonstrating your lack of macro-awareness? You're right, Carl, I admitted. That's my problem. They appear so perfect, so superhuman, that I can't see how I could ever be like them, and I can't imagine how I could be happy for very long being a midget among giants for the rest of my life either. In other words, John, you found the snake in your Garden of Eden, and it's you. Well, I said reluctantly, I hadn't thought of it quite that way, but I guess you're right. 
It was a poison of my own self-doubt that made me want to run away from 2150 and its impossible challenges. Are you saying that you're ready to give up your dream world? Carl asked. I realized that I wanted to avoid the question. I didn't want to have to answer it. I said, I don't know how to answer you right now. All I really want to do is get drunk and forget the whole thing. You what? Carl's face was lined with concern. It's that bad, John? Carl knew that I'd been drunk only once in my life back in Vietnam. Oh, no, not really, Carl. Nothing's that bad except living in a world where killing women, old folks, and children is a patriotic duty. No, I'm not going to get drunk. I'm going to write it all down. Maybe that'll help clear my mind. Then I'm going to do a whole lot of thinking. For the rest of the day, Carl left me to myself while I wrote my journal and did a lot of very hard thinking. By late evening, I had a much better realization of the strength of my micro-self, which sounded like a drum beating out the old refrain, I can't, I can't, I can't. These old habitual limiting thought patterns were so easy to disguise, to ignore, or to rationalize away. And yet, in moments of crisis, Microman, myself, must reap the consequences of his limiting beliefs. Failure. Strangely, however, my long struggle to confront myself honestly left me feeling hopeful. Again, I was joyfully looking forward to returning to the macro society of the future. I had again discovered that if I was honest with myself and refused to run away from a difficult self-confrontation, I would sooner or later see a balanced picture in which there was both light and dark. It was not easy to see both sides of a coin from a micro, one-sided view. Just before I went to bed, Carl finished reading my journal and, without saying a word, walked over to me. Tears glazed his eyes, which shocked me, knowing how Carl hated sentimental weakness which included masculine tears. Then, obviously too caught up with feeling to speak, he took my left hand with his, hesitated a moment, then put his right hand gently on my face. Before I could collect myself, Carl was noisily running the water in the bathroom with a closed door between us. I thought again how difficult it was in our micro-society to deal openly and honestly with our thoughts and emotions. We were taught to be ashamed of such large portions of our mind that we devoted whole lifetimes to denying them, thus depriving ourselves of some of the greatest joys available to man. Later, as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard Carl call across our darkened room to me. Good luck, he said. Then, after a pause, I believe in you, John. I murmured my thanks and decided that the hardest thing for Microman to do was to believe in himself. But then, how can anyone believe in himself when there's so much of himself that he condemns? My last thoughts before dropping off to sleep involved a conclusion that before I could ask for help, I had to believe that success was possible. That meant I had to accept and believe in myself as unlimited, except by my own thoughts. <laughs>